just really pleased to have you, Kev. You know, uh, known you a long time, and uh, definitely uh, have de he's definitely bought a, a few records off of uh, Noriega and uh, the Noriega family. We really respect Kev. He's he's a he, I can't even words can't describe how how big a name and how you know great a person he is. Great a person. <laughs> <laughs> great person. Oh, all right then. All right, folks. I fooled you, then, Mike. I fooled you. <laughs> <laughs> so, folks, we've got about 10 questions. We've got show and tell plus the lightning round. But my best quality is, is being honest and transparent with you. And, and the name Kev Darge is, is new to me. Um, there was an email that I had a good friend send to me weeks back. And I kept seeing this name, Kev Darge. And I said to myself, man, they're calling this guy the inventor of, of, of deep funk. And so I started to do my research. And then I had that That's woke it. moment experience, right? When we talk about Kev Darge, we talk about a, a, a Scottish DJ who came on the scene in, in, in the 70s a, a, as a dance champion. Before that, he was a Taekwondo champion, influenced by his sister's record collection. He is the man behind Northern Soul and, and playing all of that. Um, um, world renowned DJ impacting people all over the world. But what stood out to me most about Kem is just the incredible body of work, the way that he was able to, to find the music, the way that he was able to connect to it and then share it with the world. From uh, KD to BBE, he's produced a handful of album compilations. He's toured all over the place. I am so excited to have our guest here today. I'm going to stop this introduction because we have lots of questions and I'm looking for lots of stories. Kev, welcome to the show. I'm so happy to have you, man. Handful of compilations. I did 26. <laughs> you <bugger. laughs> Kev, for, for the first question, um, right. you know, we have a lot of great collectors come through this show and all right. they all seem to talk about that woke moment. That woke okay. moment when they heard the record play, what they felt, what they saw. Can you talk right. to us about that, that day that you fell in love with the music, what you saw in front of you in the scene? Um, I, I believe it was Human Beings, which was the record that might have really kicked things off for you. Can you talk a little right. bit about that first? Yeah, I didn't fall in love with the music at first. I fell in love with the scene. So as you mentioned in the question you sent me, I got a kick in at school. Uh, I Got out of hospital after a week or two and, that, and then picked on one guy and he spun around and caught me with a sidekick and then a fucking axe kick to my shoulder. I goes down like, what the fuck was that? He said, oh, it's Taekwondo. Where'd you do that? Local Royal Air Force Base. Can I come? So I joined the RAF Taekwondo Club. Now, they had their Christmas party in 1974 and it was your usual shite of the day, like Abba, Gary Glitter and all that. And then these three guys went up to the DJ and handed them some records and started dancing. And they were spinning about doing tricks. And I thought, oh, yeah, fucker. If I can dance like that, I'm about to have um, carnal knowledge of a young lady. And uh, so I goes up and says, what the fuck's all this? I was Northern Soul. There's a night in Dundee uh, Saturday. Do you want to come? I said, yes, I'll come to Dundee with you on Saturday. So I went to my first all-nighter in Dundee. Well, it wasn't an all-nighter. It was a soul night, a Northern Soul night. was an all-nighter. And, uh, and I'm sitting watching the dancing, and that's what attracted me at first. But on that night, the DJ played the human beings. Ned Jordan was the DJ's name. If I'm speaking too fast and you need a translator, do tell me. But, You're um, all right, brother. You're all right. Yeah, the, I'm we, all right, we, we, right. We can see the subtitles. The subtitles are coming. Exactly. Right. Get them up later. So the human beings came on, and I thought, "Woo, you fucker, what's this? Again, Jesus Christ. And that was my first moment in my life of walking up to the DJ box and saying, what the fuck is that? And then the guy told me, and I, all nighters back then, you used to have big record bars. At the Marriott Hall then day, it was out in the hallway, and the passageway was all the folks selling records, boxes and boxes of records. So I went straight out there, up and down, asking if anyone had the human beings. Mm -hmm. Nobody had it. And then, then I got it about three weeks later, but it was the first record I made a point of looking for. However, I didn't get into the music. I started going to Wigan, I started going to all nighters and all that for the dancing and all that. And it gradually grew on me. It gradually hit me that some of these records I don't really like. And then this one's fucking brilliant. And whoa. And then I started to took about a year before I started paying attention to what the tunes were. And, uh, and also, because I was living in Aberdeen at the time, and there was nobody else in Aberdeen in the Northern Soul, I thought I'd better buy some of these records and take them to the local discos to get the local DJs to play so I can have a dance. And maybe I'll have carnal knowledge of a young lady with my fancy dancing. <laughs> so I started buying records. But um, 
I was just buying them so I could dance at first. A year or so later, it sunk into me. That's shit, that's shit, oh fuck me, that's good, that's shit, that's good. And then I started to focus on what the really good ones were. I love that, I love that. So one of the things that I'm always fascinated by, um, you know, nowadays we've got technology, it's easy to see, to find, to buy from anywhere. But uh, I'm always fascinated with how folks were, were acquiring these records back in the day, specifically when it comes to geography. Um, Miss Goldie, uh, Melbourne, Australia, incredible collection. But, but you are so far from, from these, re so far from the source. Can you talk to me about how you were acquiring records early on, who you were with, who you were meeting that you were, you were getting these records, and, and what you were thinking when you were hearing the music you know, for the first time? These records well, that I think you, you coined at one point as junk records. <laughs> hi. So I was very lucky, you see, because I was Scottish. And another Scottish chap on the northern scene, and there wasn't many of us at that time, was a guy called John Anderson. Mm, and John Anderson, I was Scottish, and says, Kev, I've got some tunes for you. Kev, I've got some tunes for you. And then I'd go to the nightclubs, and because I was a fancy dancer, that they knew was buying records to take up to Scotland. A lot of the dealers, there was a guy, Rob Lythel, would meet me in the balcony at Wigan, and have a little cardboard box. Kev, I've got a couple of unknowns for you. There you go, what? 20 quid, 20 quid. Uh, and folk would come and look from early on, from after about a year, folk were looking me out with little boxes and saying, just got back from the States, Kev. Have a listen to that, see if you like that, see if you like that. So I was very, very lucky. Folk were feeding records to me early on. You know, wow. That. And the guy the, the guy he's talking about, the guy he's talking about, John Anderson, he's the first guy that I bought a rare Northern Soul record from. And I'm when I, when I say rare, you know, it was probably 15 pounds at the time. Which Kev will know that's that's a lot of money, you know, fifteen pounds for a record at that time when you know in the eighties or you know even in the nineties, fifteen pounds was still like that. Was, I mean, over there they they were paying you know five hundred, six hundred pounds, but over in the states for me to pay twenty five dollars. But Anderson was the was the guy that I met first in Austin. I met him in Austin, Texas at the record show, and okay. you know he found some stuff in the pile, and I was like, I want that. He's like, well, it's fifteen, it's fifteen quid, you know, in the uh, UK. And he's yeah. he's a Scot he's a Scottish guy too, you know. He's from Scotland too, I believe, right, uh, Kev? Oh, uh, he's from Glasgow. Yeah, yeah. He was he's probably Scottish the biggest too. dealer of soul records in Europe was Anderson, if not the world, really. Yeah, he was he was one of the originators as far as, as selling like dealers. He'd come over here and buy you know a mountain of records and take them back and you know give them all to the right DJs and they would play them and, and, wow. and that's how you, yeah, that's how you got the that's how you got the scene. A lot of, a lot of the guys would get them from John. That's incredible. Oh, oh so, Richard Salem was fed by John, like spoon fed by him. The big, the top DJ at Wigan was spoon fed by John. Yeah. Even some records, I believe he bought, he didn't buy them, he rented them and then gave them back to John after a year or something so John <laughs> could sell them at a profit. That's true. <laughs> yeah, wow. that's funny, man. That's, well, funny. that's classic. So gentlemen, I, I've got a question for both of you. Um, and I think this is a fantastic opportunity to ask a question like this. We have two serious collectors that have known each other. Y'all have, have DJed, y'all played for crowds. Can you talk to me about what, what was it like back in the day when words like competition come up, um, acquiring <laughs> records, attitudes? Um, what was the objective back then in contrast to, to now? Do you want to go first, Mike? No, you go for it. All right, then. A uh, competition for me, fucking brilliant. So when I was at Stafford, me and Guy Hennigan were at war with each other. We loved each other. If he got a new record one week, and I was like, bastard, I've got to get something better. So I'd just go around all the fucking dealers, all the collectors, and go through their boxes, try to find something that hadn't been played that was good. But the benefit of that was, because I was competing with Guy all the time, the crowd benefited, because we were trying to get the best fucking records we could. And the, the whole Northern scene was based on competition in the, in the 70s. It was like... It was all new discoveries. There was no oldies then. Oldies didn't exist when I first started going. It all had to be brand new discoveries all the fucking time. And you had to have the best new discoveries. And if you had a set which was exclusively yours, that nobody else could play because you covered them all up, you got the bookings if they were good. And if your set was shit, you didn't get the bookings. And that's where it used to make big expensive records, special sounds that only you were playing. And that's what I wanted. That's what I still sort of want, really. It's pretty hard now. Okay. 
Mike, can you talk a little yeah. bit about your, your perspective? Because I remember you saying that- For, for, us, like, it's different. for us, it was different because you got to remember, I was collecting Northern in probably about 86 or 87. After I got the Soul Supply album, the first one, um, I was chasing those records. You know, a lot of our friends, they didn't like that stuff. You know, in the 80s, like, the Northern Soul records were pushed aside. Even the Sweet Soul records were pushed aside. At the, at the 80s, it was like everyone's looking for doo-wop. So I was looking for those records. And when I went to go play those records out in a regular environment, not even a DJ scene, People are like, turn that off. You know, I don't want, it's too fast. They weren't used to the speed, you know, because uh, Northern Soul is like a hybrid, like we talked about, of like the Motown, the Detroit scene, the Chicago scene, but it's very uh, produced. A lot of the songs are produced or they're really fast and, uh, um, you know, up-tempo because it's, it's uh, drug-driven, you know. It's, it was, the scene was uh, very, um, very, very speeded up, you know. But when yeah, I finally cool. started DJ Northern, it was this guy named Gabby, um, he used to run uh, a northern soul scene out here with this girl named Nancy. And uh, I used to just show up. And really, there wasn't no competition because they weren't really collectors. I know Nancy had a lot of good records. Uh, she used to play. Uh, I had already been collecting northern for so long already. By the time I, was, I, I you know, got to DJ, I mean, not to have a big head or nothing, but pretty much me and Nancy and Gabby were the only ones that had any records. Everybody else was just kind of following our path, you know, our, our guidance. Gabby had been DJing at the Crush, so he knew all the right tunes. Like he'd play all the classics, where we were still ingesting it all and taking it in. So it was more like it wasn't really a like for us. It wasn't a competition because there wasn't enough people to compete, and there wasn't nobody that was trying to stand off against me or Gabby or Nancy or Carlos was another one. He was DJ at the time, and then George Rodriguez had just started to get into it. He was coming to my house. We were making cassettes and. He was starting to like, you know, pay a few bucks for records. Now he's crazy. He'll pay like, you know, I don't even talk about what he'll pay, but you know, it's it's just different. For over here, it wasn't wasn't there wasn't really competition because the scene was so small. You know, we might get fifty heads. We're in, in a big northern show, you know, like Clee Thorpe's or Press Stat, and they get thousands of people, you know, on the dance floor. Yeah, um, Kev, let me ask you this. You know, you, you were friends with, with Curtis Mayfield, George Clinton through Collecting Records. What was your perspective on the scene and collectors in the States while you were in, in Europe? It depends what period you're talking about. In the 70s, I used to think, why the fuck do the Yanks not want these records? Jesus, they're so fucking cheap. In fact, sure. I, I, never, I never went to the States in the 70s because it was so easy to get them here because so many folk were shipping them over. And you could buy them here, and you'll get unknown back then for 50 pence or a pound. You know, that wasn't until, you know, someone had been established that it went up in price. Mm -hmm. you know? So you were finding, you know, things like the, the Cairo's on Shrine, I got dirt cheap, and a lot of really big, big, silly money records. Tony Gala, six quid or something I paid for that when I got it. Nobody wanted them. You know, and then you play them, and then they start wanting them. Same thing. It's funny, it's funny, you, bring, it's funny you bring that up. <laughs> really well, funny you bring up the Kairos on Shrine, because when I, I was collecting Shrine at one time, I was trying to run the whole label, and that was the one title that I never got, and some crazy maniac offered me a ton of money for the counts, and uh, I never ended up finishing the, the whole complete you know, Shrine, and after that, it was just like, all right, the Shrines are, are going to go out, you know? But oh, yeah, wow. when you bring up the, the Cairo is such a great dance record, you know? That's one to check out for the people out there, you know, stop overlooking me. What a monster. Too bad. You know? I get to dance to it, though. I used to play it covered up as the precisions, and wow. it took me a month before they yeah. responded. And after that, they were like, fucking hell, give us it, give us it, give us it. Yeah, it's probably, Wiley. probably six or $7,000 record now. Is it? Christ me, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's so, probably why I don't buy Northern now. <laughs> Kev, I, I got to ask you this. Um, we had FOS Dave, who, who's known in the States as a record collector affiliated with the Preservation Project. And one of the questions I asked him about was, what, are the, what do you remember most about the records? And he always said to me, it wasn't the records, it was the people. So I'd love to ask you and Mike, what were your influences? Who were the leaders on, on your scene? Who was your North Star that you were looking to, to acquire information, to kind of start to form your own opinions about the records that you wanted to go after? when to explore, when to take a risk, and so on like that. 
Uh, so my main inspiration would have been Richard Seelan at Wigan. I studied him and the fact that he had a very high standard. He wouldn't play pish. He did play a couple of pish records, but he wouldn't play many pish records. And he would always play new discoveries and turn them over, make them big. As soon as someone else got a copy, he'd drop it and put in another new discovery, but it had to be of a really high standard. I thought, that's what I'm going to fucking do. Uh, as for getting the knowledge... I was very lucky, so I had fucking loads of mates on the scene. So the northern scene in Britain at that time, every fucker had records, you know? Firstly, everyone <laughs> going to Wigan had boxes of records, eh? and some of those records were things that hadn't been played, and everyone sort of liked me because I was this fancy dancer who got on well with folks, so I was getting records signed. I was like Butch used to supply me, you know, Butch, Mark Dobson. He yeah. used, before he started DJing, he'd come to me with a box. I remember sitting outside Wigan Casino in Butch's Volkswagen van with him and Tisha, and Tim Ashibendia, and he'd play yeah. a cassette tape to me, and that's 20 quid, that's 25 quid, that's 50 quid, that's 30 quid, that's it. You know, pick the ones I want. Yeah, t Tim Ashibendia, yeah. I met him in Austin. He's a really, really knowledgeable guy. Oh, it's fucking I. Lovely boy, you know, with perfect taste. But I, apart from then, I had Pete Lawson, I had fucking Guy Hennigan, I had John Anderson, as we mentioned, Dave Raystrick, Dave Withers, loads of folk fucking feeding me with records. And John Manship, I used to go on buying trips with John Manship and the deal was, I got the unknowns and he got the easy to sell stuff. And that's why I was his, I did all the dirty work. Uh, he'd sit and drink coffees and eat sandwiches while I'm digging through the boxes, <laughs> picking out the stuff for him to take home. Yeah. Sorry, I do talk a bit when you get me going. No, 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 I love it. You're, you're doing great. So my next question goes like this. Bootlegs, reissues, or originals. Can you talk about chasing super spendy records, what your motivation was, and, and what it felt like when these were in the hands? But more importantly, Kev, I know that, that records that you, would, you were collecting and playing had a shelf life, meaning you could only play it so many times at a certain you know, number of nights at, at, at the club. Can you talk about that in detail for me? Eh, quite easily, yeah. This is why I got fed up with Deep Funk and all that, because uh, I did it for 20 years, and I wasn't getting any great new discoveries. Folk were finding new discoveries, but I didn't think they were as good as Carlene and the Groovers or things like that, or Leon Gardner. I thought, nah, I want something as good as that to play. And the same with the Northern... Well, the Northern thing, no. I got divorced, so I had to sell my collection. Then by the time I started buying again... I saw Butch play, and I thought, oh, you fucker, there's no way I'm going to catch up with that, not with the prices of records today. So I just packed in. Uh, but for me, records, I'm a DJ. I'm not a collector. I wouldn't have class myself as a collector. For a while, when I was doing Deep Funk, and <clears throat> I was coming home with wheelbarrows full of money every weekend, I started collecting, because I could afford to. Mm -hmm. But now I want killer tunes to play, and like you say, I'll play them for a year or two, then, right, I'm sick of that, give me someone new. And I, I'm no rich just now, so I'll sell something to buy someone, sell something to buy someone. So churning over records. I would love to keep everything that I've enjoyed, but I'm just not that fucking rich. You know? Sure. Did, uh, does that answer the question or did I waffle? Well, partially. So I, I would love to know, give me a story on a big record that you chased, because you, you and Mike were going after records before they were big, before they were in the thousands, but back then you knew what it felt like. You knew what you were looking for. Can you just uh, give a story about chasing a big record and kind of well, the uh, around that? So I wouldn't chase it because I wouldn't know it. Um, the records that I made big, I didn't know them when I bought them, so I wasn't chasing them. I just came across the... So I'd look at an obscure label and think, that looks fucking obscure. Ooh, all right, I'll give that a listen. Shite, next one, shite, next one, shite, next one. Ooh, you fucker, that's good. Oh, they've got a fucking shitty break in there. No, next one. Until I found someone good, then I'd play it. So I had access to thousands of records because of all my mates were big collectors. Then coming to the stage, you've got access to thousands of records. Um, what's the guy up in Canada? Martin Capel. He locked yeah. me in his warehouse for a few nights and I just sat there with a soundboard going through fucking everything until I finished every work. Same when I went to anywhere else, go through every fucking record that you don't know and listen to them if it takes you a week to do it. And I found big records which weren't big at the time, if that makes sense. Um, after the internet, now I'm chasing big records because you've got to pay for everything now, so I have to pay for things. And because I've got into the rocket scene or the scene too late, 
virtually everything's been discovered, so now I have to chase big records that have been established and I've got to take place on them. But back in the soul days, no, I was getting... Well, that's a fucking lie. I mean, Butch came down to guest with me at uh, Deep Funk and he put on Mellow Madness. And Deep Funk and Georgia was, I was like, oh, yeah, come, I want that. Fucking hell. So I went around <laughs> every fucking day because you had one. And I found this guy that had it. And I was like, right, I'll give you a thousand for it. Nah, fuck off. Right, I'll give you two thousand for it. Nah, fuck off. Right, three thousand. Right, it's yours, Kate. And all that. So I did go daft on that. And probably a few others, if I'm honest. But my main memory was of finding things that weren't big, that nobody wanted. So you're the funk. I used to go to my old Scottish Northern soulmates and Jolly from Edinburgh, who used to DJ in the 70s, gave me JB's Latin. He gave me, um, that's what Arthur Mundy, he gave me, you know, for nothing. You know? So I was very lucky, me. I was very lucky that I knew all the big collectors in Britain and they were ah. all nice. Yeah, that's how, that's how it would be out here. You know, the guys that would play records, you would just stand over it and look at it. It wasn't like, you know, they didn't want to share it. You know, nowadays, it's like, let's cover it up. Let's put that fucking big, you know, thing on top of it. You know, I know that they covered them up in the UK, but for us, we didn't cover them up. You know, in the UK, it was it was important to cover up because, you know, you were protecting your sound. You were protecting your, your but if you were, like what Kev says, if you were friends with the guy or the guy was a dealer, if it was like Manship or if it was Anderson or if it was one of these other guys that had this record played, I'm sure Keb could figure it out or get to it. You know what I mean? It wasn't like... But see, a lot of times when, when that DJ is already playing that record over and over, Keb's not going to chase that record because that dude's already... That's like his record. Like, he's playing it. Yeah. He wants to go and just... He wants to go discover his own shit. You know what I mean? He ain't trying to, like... and He ain't trying to be a biter. <laughs> you know, he's trying to, like, yeah. do his own shit, you know? Uh, I found most of my good stuff in those shit piles. Everyone had a shit box, and I'd go through the shit boxes and think, ooh, that's not shit, mate. That's good. Yeah. yeah. Well, shit boxes, that's where all the deep funk was at first. Well, that's what they call breaking a record. Like, Keb would believe in it, and he would hear it and, and like it. Somebody else would be like, nah, I don't like it. But Keb would play it over and over, and he would impact it in your brain and say, oh, mm. now I get it. I feel it. Because there's records like that. There's records you hear the first time, they suck. Records you hear it the second time, well, it's getting a little better. And then third or fourth time, you're like, wow, I'm starting to feel it, and I'm starting to get it. And then other records, you hear it the first time, and you love it. You know what I mean? And then everything else is just shit. That's it. I, I yeah. love that. That's a really great perspective right there and, and, and just kind of, you know, thoughts around it. I want to skip to another question kind of out of turn. This is great for both of you. And I think it's awesome because we've got folks on, on different parts of, of the globe here. Can you talk about the trends that you've seen from collectors, DJs over the course of time? Um, thoughts on, on paying big money for a record right that that is an original but might be beaten into the ground thousands or going for a reissue or a bootleg i would love to get your both of your perspectives on this well those that spend great big amounts of money on scratch records are wankers in my fucking opinion just daft just trying to show they've got a huge coke look at the size of my coke or look at my record <laughs> i mean really i was at press starting and some cunt played an eddie parker that skipped three times i thought what the fuck are you playing that for? It's a record that's been played for over 40 years. It's a dead record. And you're just showing off that you've got this fucking, whatever it is, 7,000 pound record, even though it's a fuck copy. It's stupid. You know, it's really stupid. Um, I think it's, so I don't enjoy Northern Soul Nights. No, it's the same tunes over and over again. It's like, oh, come on, you fucker. And the only thing I'll go, I'm going to the Hunter Club this Saturday to hear Butch just say it, because I know Butch is going to play a set of good new discoveries and maybe a few that I don't know at all and some that he's been playing for a year or two. And that'll excite me. But, oh, this fucking... I've got, uh, whatever, Pat Lewis and I've got blah, blah, blah. It's like, ah, oh, fuck off. You know, it was great in 1975. <laughs> it's not so exciting now, son. For us, for me. It's, a, it's a whole different thing. Because uh, we we kind of like, we go in a circle over here. And the reason I say that is the guys that I knew that collected Sweet Soul Records um, ended up liking Northern because they were hanging around with me or they were listening to tapes. We would make tapes. I'll, give, I'll, I'll push it in their brain. Like, listen to this, man. The inspiration's on Midas. Your wishes might come on. You have to listen to this. 
I don't like this stuff. I don't like it. I don't like it. Just, I don't care. Just listen to it. And they would put the tape on and they would suffer through it. And, you know, by the, by the end of the month or the end of the year, they were chasing those same records because the music's good, man. The music's solid, you know, and for us it, versus then and now and what's happening now, I see that everyone that's in the sweet soul now, because, you know, that's the big scene right over here is sweet soul. Everybody wants those, you know, uh, rollas. They want the lowrider jams. They want the... They want the the jams that make them feel good. They're very heartfelt. But I'm going to tell you right now, man, some of those group harmony, northern mid-tempo things, or even even some of the fast stuff, you can hear the same love and passion in those records. And I, I really feel, my heart of hearts, I'll speak it now, I really think that a lot of the raza, a lot of the people that are collecting right now, that are Latinos, that like the sweet soul and the lowrider stuff, will end up into liking those northern soul records. Because after a while, you're just going to get tired of that same tune and you want to hear something, you know, different. And um, I don't know, man. I, I don't know. What do you think about that, Kev? Uh, well, actually, I've just been thinking about what I said and thought, Kev, you're talking shit. What I said applies to the British Northern scene. Uh, yeah. To the rest of the world, to young people in their 20s. So I went to a night, a mate was playing it on Saturday, was it? And it was full of folk under 25 dancing to Northern. Yeah. Shitty dancing, but they were fucking enjoying hearing classics, yeah, that's, that's... which... Like, oh, this all, is that matters, all that matters, right? It's the music. In the long run, it's all about the music. Uh, if it's fresh to them, fine. So, you know. Yeah. So I moan because I'm like, I've fucking heard them all. Uh, but I suppose a young 22 year old's never heard Eddie Parker. It's a treat for them. So I'm being selfish with that thing I said. But then I'm going to an all nighter up north here and it's folk in their 60s like me listening to the same old tunes. And those fucking DJs we were talking about with their scratchy Eddie Parkers, they're in their 60s. I'm like, come on. So yeah, I really, I really think that Kev changed the game because you got to think about it. He'll DJ a party, and he was one of the first guys that I know of that would play garage music with some kind of like you know or freak beat or some kind of tempo, and people are just like, that's like it becomes an anthem because Kev plays it over and over. They're like, wait, I get it, I feel it. You know, I have a lot of respect for him because I like garage music too. I don't really collect it. But I feel like, I mean, I have like one little box, you know, but I feel like there's such a good vibe with that music, you know, because it's all, it's very, it's soulful too, you know, it has a lot of love in it, you know, I, I don't know. I think that he really broke ground with that. I, I don't know if you wanted to talk about that, but I think it's important. Hey, I was late to the garage scene, you know, it was collected way before I got in the garage and all that. But like, you can, so I have learned the technique of thumping a record into people's heads. I use the microphone a lot and, you know, I'm quite rude and vociferous, and then folks pay attention. You listen, you fuckers, and then they pay attention. And then you can thump the records into them. But only if it's a good record. There's no point thumping a shite record yeah. into people. They have to be good records, you know that. And with the garage thing, I mean, I'm playing stuff which is new to me and new to my crowd, but is old to the garage collectors. You know, the garage yeah. collectors were way ahead of me on that one. But that's they did that's garage at Wigan. Eh? That's, that's, that's groundbreaking to me, you know, uh -huh. the way that you play garage records mixed into your soul set or just the way you play them. It's just like, I mean, who would, who would think to do that? You know, it's just it's genius. Uh, well, someone said to me, the great advantage I have is my dancing because I'm a fancy dancer that's always loved fucking dancing. I can work out how, how folk are going to respond <laughs> and how they're going to speed up and slow down their dancing. No, no, that's right. I'm being, did he laugh, you fucker? I'm being serious. <laughs> I can. I can like, think, right, I can get them going at this speed, then I'll speed them up a bit, then I'll bring them down, but I'm not going to chop and change. So I've been to some DJs and there's fucking chop and change the speed of the records all over the shop. I'm like, what the fuck are you doing? How can anyone dance to that? You have to yeah, make it people, flow. Nobody really does that. You know, like, that's, that's really amazing. All right. Well, seems confusing to me why they don't, but uh, well, so, you, Kev, you feel the rhythm, you feel the beat, you know, it's like, I'm a drummer, right. you know, the beat is everything. All right. Uh, Kev, so the, the theme of our show is Tales from the Crates, and, and normally I just allow any any story to be picked from the guest, but okay. it was either last night or it was this morning, you started to tell me about a push-up contest with Mad Lib and MF Doom while Egon judged. Now, the reason I'm bringing right. this question up now is because... We've got a lot of folks that have found soul and, and funk through hip hop. And uh, that's because they love MF Doom, they love Madlib, and, and, and they know Egon far and wide. Could you tell us about that story and, and give us 
your interpretation of, of just kind of hanging out with the MF Doom, a Mad Lib, and an Egon? How did it happen? Well, so uh, Egon, I think, would have been the first. I can't even fucking remember how we got in contact, but I used to go out to LA and DJ a lot in LA. And, that, and I stayed in Egon's flat that he shared with Peanut Butter Wolf and a couple of those. And I mind Madlib coming in, getting his hairs done, was sitting in a chair next to me for like two hours where this old wife he was fiddling with his fucking hair. I'm like, Jesus Christ, what well, carry on, just shave you fucker. You know that. <laughs> we became very good friends. You know that. So whenever they come over to Britain, they always phone us up and say, yo, yo, Kim, let's go out, man, let's go drinking. So they were staying at the Ace Hotel. And we went out, we went drinking, we got blazing fucking drunk. And on the way home, I can't even mind how it came up, but they were like, yeah, you Scots fucking feeble bastards. Or come on, push up competition. So the three of us got on the pavement with people walking by and did push ups, all blazing drunk. And I won. I won. I beat them both. But uh, no, I love it. Okay. I don't know how well. I didn't know MF Doom that well. I just saw him a few times we were drinking up a lot when I drove together. But uh, Otis, yeah, very friendly with Otis. You know, he got me records from his dad. His dad actually gave him records to give to me because he told his dad that I'd played his record at Stafford, blah, 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 in the, in the early 80s. And that. So I got on very well with Madly. And, uh, and, aye, and he collects. You know, We're meant to be doing a compilation together with BBE, but licensing's a pain in the arse. A garage comp. Mad Lib collects well, garage as well. Yeah. Is that an exclusive? Is it something you're working on? Well, it's something I was working on, and we got the tracks about three years ago. And that, but BB have been struggling like buggery to license any of them. I think they got three tunes. That's it. You know, it's wow. a hard thing to license tunes these days. Yeah, it is. Or so they That's tell me. Maybe they just don't want to give me any money. <laughs> So, Kev, one of the things also that, that, you know, as I was coming across your name, I was finally getting these visuals of, of what Northern Soul looked like, what it felt uh, like. And, and I would love it if you could describe what the Northern Soul scene, environment, community was like. More importantly, you said names like Wigan, the casino, and so on like that. Could you talk about that so that folks that might not be familiar can really yeah. see a picture of what it was that you were, you were experiencing? Uh, all right, then I'll do it in a philosophical way. So this is the 70s. There was nothing on offer, really, other than being a, a heavy metal rocker and biting the heads off chicken and pissing in your jeans, or pop music. That was it. You know, disco hadn't arrived, I sort of think. And then suddenly you come across this scene where there's folk dancing like real fuckers, and they were cool, very cool dressed. It was a completely different world. It was an exciting world before there was any underground subcultures sort of thing okay. for us you know rock and roll and all that had been but it wasn't that sort of underground subculture it was an over the surface but northern soul at the time it was abba like i say heavy rock or northern soul and the cool fuckers got into northern soul you know um but it wasn't cool cool fuckers because if they were not used to go down to Dundee and all that they were real fucking thugs they were in and out of prison all the time it was real like hooligans that were violent bastards in their normal lives, but when they got into a dance floor, they became fairies and danced beautifully and gracefully to this beautiful music, you know? But on a Tuesday, they're stabbing some fuckers to steal their drugs and all that. It was a strange crowd. But I can only talk about the Scottish crowd because I was going down from Scotland. We didn't mix with the English until maybe the 80s because there were strange people, strange people, the English. <laughs> oh, wow. I love, I love that. Um, and, and the other thing that I had heard about kind of the Northern Soul music in the club was it was almost like people when they were dancing, it was a per their performance to the song. Can you elaborate elaborate on that? Talk about the spin move? Ah, you get like taken. So, ah, you, so you have to be, so you have to stretch. So I was doing Taekwondo, so I was very well stretched and shit like that. And then the tune gets you and there's a break in the tune. And you think, oh, I've got to do something Ooh, this is exciting, but oh, I get excited, and your body responds in an excited fashion to the break on the tune. Or you get a brrr, drum roll, and the brrr, you spin, and on the brrr bit. So it was all done to the music, but it was the music that dictated how you dance, sort of thing then. And that, but you did, uh, I remember I did copy every fucker. When I first started going, I thought, fuck me, how do I do that? You know, Jesus Christ, what are they doing? Oh, they're floating with their feet, all oh, right. Oh, he's in the splits, right, I'll do that. 
Um, so, yeah, so like you said, Mike, there was a lot of gear being taken, loads of speed and all that, and you were off your head and you were oh, into your music. You know, if Raquel Welsh had come up and tapped me on the shoulder and said, Kev, do you want to come back to the tail of fancy a poke? I'd like, fuck off, I'm dancing. Listen, he's playing this, would have been my response type thing. So it was the speed and the atmosphere and it, the whole thing was about music. The whole thing was about the records. You know, there was no picking up a girl. There was no... Um, and it wasn't even showing off like you say. It was more like, fuck off, stop looking at me. You're putting me off. So that night the cameras came. Uh, the documentary that you see, that night the cameras came. They had fucking great big fuck off lights all over the place, wires all over the floor. And these London wankers saying, hey, could, you, uh, could you do that again, please? Yeah, that was amazing. And I'm thinking, fuck off, you London wanker. So most of the... <laughs> Most of the good dancers sat down and thought, fuck this, their night's <laughs> been ruined by these cameras. Oh, man. I'm That's true. <laughs> All the sitting, fucking looking at the cameras, thinking, fuck off back to London, leave us alone, type of thing. Oh, so you won't wow. unfortunately. Okay. Did so I answer your question? <laughs> you, you did a fantastic job. I don't think you could have answered it any better, but this yeah. is a fantastic segue to talk about records that move you. We talked about you sharing three records that Hi. you recently got that are really moving. Hi. I'm hoping you can show them, talk about them, and give us a little snippet. Right, so I'm going to have to show you them, three of them in a go, and then go and give you a snippet because my record player's in the bedroom and I'm not. So I'll show you them first. So <laughs> the first thing, these are ones that I just got in the last month or so. Wait a minute, how do I do this? Oh, that's back to front, is it? Um, uh, hold it up a little higher. Perfect. The Tormentors, she's gone. So it's a, it's one of these stories. It's a nice cheap record, you know, if you find it. Took me about 10 fucking years to find one, though. You know that. And it's a nice, I'll play it in a wee minute for you. It's a nice sort of mid tempo garage thing. So I got the feel of soul. So I get from the garage records exactly what I got from the Northern Soul records inside me. Mm -hmm. It's like sense. a California. Is it California? Kim? Oh, fuck, I'm going to have to look at the label. Hold on. I've got no like bloody a, idea. It looks, like looks like a monarch pressing, that's why. All right. Now my eyes aren't that good either. See, this is where I let go. No idea. Uh. So I'm, I'm, like I say, I'm not a collector. I don't have this knowledge. Now, this next one, I fucking shot my load in my pants when I first heard it. And then uh, <laughs> what I did, I went on to all these record collector groups on Facebook, and I went through every single one of the members' Facebook photographs to see which person had a copy. And I found two people with copies. Then I made them a both an offer they couldn't refuse, and one of them did fucking refuse. And then I went, all right, then go on, Cape, I'll sell it to you. And it's the... The rock shop, is that your halo? Rowena. Rowena. It looks like, the label looks like shit, and the title sounds like it's going to be shit, but it's one of the best records I've ever had in my life, in my opinion. Wow. wow. Don't know wow. it. Like, it would have gone a storm at Wigan Casino. It's garage, but I guarantee it would have packed the floor at Wigan. Wow. wow. And the last one just arrived early this week, was it? Monday? I can't even mind when it arrived. Friday or Monday. And that one I was looking for, when I got them back from the grave compilations, this was on there. I better go back a bit. It's us. Don't want, what the fuck is... My memory shit. I have to look at the record. I'm playing to read the name of it. Don't want your loving, but it's us. It's Magnificent, us. Dirty, nasty garage. Wouldn't have gone into the Northern Soul scene at all. Too nasty for them, but I love that. That, that appeared a Penny for, but I love it. Would you like me to play them the whole record or just a bit? Just, just, just a, bit. a snippet would be great. Before you do, I have a question. I got to ask this question. You talked about the feeling that you got from Garage was similar to Soul. Identical. Can you, yeah. can you describe that feeling? Because that was so, like, I felt that. Can you talk about the um, mm, So, I'm a, it's a sort of energy. It has to be the good records, not the shit records, but the great northern records and the great garage records, one, they give you that whoa, and then you get a sense of purity and honesty from the tune, from the singer, from even just the musicians. There's a purity. They're really playing this because we're really enjoying this and they really feel this. They're not control. I don't know. It's hard to put into words. But So I didn't get that feeling from funk. 
in the slightest. When I was playing deep funk, I was buying rockabilly on the side for myself because I got that feeling from rockabilly, but not from funk. Uh, but rockabilly, I felt I could never really play because it's not strong or deep or heavy enough for general club public. I did try it for a few years, but it didn't work as well as funk did. And, uh, but the garage is so close to Northern, it's so... So when I took, I uh, mentioned it on my page the other day, I took a couple of garage records up to an old Wigan mate of mine, Marky Linton, who died a few years ago and all that, and I took up a few garage records and I put them on, I played them the plagues and the omens. But before I got there, it was like, what's all this garage shite, Kev? Your rockabilly was shite, I bet you this garage is shite as well. Come on then, let's hear the fucking stuff. And I put on the first record, was the omens, and Marky was like, oh, you fucker. It's just like Northern... Fucking hell, I'm in the garage now. And then he actually, his mate told me on my, on my Instagram page just a couple of days ago, well, I remember Mark, he came round to me, he sold me all his fucking 12-inch soul, all his soul albums to get money to buy garage records the, two days after I went up there. He was like, yeah. fuck, it's just like Wigan, it's the same. Wow. Hard for people who didn't go to Wigan to understand, but the garage mm -hmm. thing to me is just like Wigan, it's the same, it's energetic, exciting stuff with the odd mid-tempo thing. Thank you oh. so much. That was huge. Right. Yeah, there, there, there was an old video that Keb posted. I think it was on Facebook, and he was DJing, and it was really loud. Like, you could barely hear the song, but you could feel the feeling of the song. And I swear it was like an, an R&B thing, like a shuffler. And I started listening more. I go, no, nah, I think it's more like Northern. And I kept listening. It was a fucking garage record. Like, it was straight up a garage record. But the feeling was all the same, man. Wow. It had that good new breed R&B slash Northern, like, just pack the dance floor kind of feeling. All right. That's it. All right. So it might just be as simple as that the really good vintage records have got that feeling and anything made after December the 31st, 1979 is shite. That could be the... <laughs> <laughs> shite. He said shite. I love that. Oh. I love that. Let's spin these records. So, <clears throat> you know, one of uh, one of my favorite guests that have been on is, is Rob Rodriguez, Wanted Records. And uh -huh. I was picking his brain one day asking questions. I'm like, how, how can I make this better? What, what are the right questions to ask? And so I want to mm -hmm. ask you something that, that he, he recommended, which is why, why the music? What was going on in your life that, that you gravitated towards this music? And most importantly, what is it that moves you the most about the music? Hmm. Putting that into words is a fucker. Um, the, the reason I got into it was because everyone else was boring at the time. You know, it was before punk, it was before disco and all that. So it was like really exciting stuff. Um, so probably for me, when I listen to a record, I envisage myself dancing to it. You know what I mean? So I, I don't collect sweet soul, I don't collect deep soul, I don't collect ballads. I've always been around dancing like and if I buy a record, I think, oh, you fucker, yeah, I could dance to that. You know, I really enjoy dancing to that. So I'll listen to it and think, oh, if someone else played that, I would be jealous. Because I'd be like, oh, yeah, I want to dance to that. I don't know. It's hard to put into words. So I just, you put a record on, you think, shite. You put the next record on, you think, oh, you fucker, that's great. And I don't know why that's great and that one's shite. Well, in some cases, you do obviously know why one's shite and why it's good, but I don't know why... You know, so people on the northern scene love that dog bounce. I just kept on dancing and things like Emperor My Baby's Heart. I think they're shit. I think, why the fuck would they play that? It's just dull pish. You know, when you think of the Vondells or uh, the obvious stuff, Larry Clinton or that, what on earth are you playing Emperor My Baby's Heart for? It's just rubbish in comparison. I used, to I, don't always, I used to always open up my set with uh, Billy Hambrick. I always liked that record. Uh, she said goodbye. Okay, mm. all right. Yeah, yeah. She said goodbye. Who was it played that? Oh, that was Richard Searlin. Yeah, he played both uh, sides of them. Yeah, just that bass. That was the Wigan Casino. Bass line. And the opening uh, bass. Oh, line great. Yeah. yeah, that's a proper record. Right uh, that's it. So I, it confuses me when DJs play records that I don't think are proper records. Well, that's not a proper record. That's pish. Uh, yeah. Mm. I'm not going to put this sort of thing in the words. It's just, I feel it or I, I don't. And that's it. Yeah. That's pretty simple, straightforward there. And I like that. I think that's true for a lot of us. We feel it right away. Otherwise, we don't connect and, and we just kind of move on. Um, right. Kev, when, when you reflect back on the body of work that you've done 
the impact that you've made on a global level. How do you want to be remembered? And, and what is most important to you, the message that you want to give to people that have been following you along your journey, the collectors of the future, and so on like that? Remember, there's a fucking good DJ would be happy for me. Uh, collectors of the future, you've got a hard time, kids. You know, it seems to be all about money nowadays. Uh, it's yeah. no, you know, it was dead easy for us. And it was really easy for me, to be honest with you, you know, because... Because I knew John Anderson and I was one of the few Scottish people he knew that wanted Northern Records, so I was getting fed, sort mm -hmm. of thing. So I was lucky, really lucky. Uh, no, it's a hard game now as a collector unless you've got money. Uh, unless you've got money. But I notice you've got, uh, you put a thing on your page where two unreleased things you're putting out and all that. And the first one, I thought, oh, you fucker, I'd have played that at Stafford or danced at Wigan. And the perfect Gary Ruffbrook sound. Yeah, hey, what's it called? That was for the project, you, no. project record yesterday. Unknown artist, Westlow Soul. Yeah. Yeah, yeah nice. So that it sounds like uh, yeah, I told cost West you West like very funny. Funny. They should buy records like that and not worry about the three thousand pound stuff that's been played to death. Buy that and play that instead, and you're getting a fresh tune. I'm not actually saying that to lick your arse and help you sell stuff. I'm like, if you're going to start collecting soul today, unless you're a really rich fucker. <laughs> you know, you can play new records cheaply, which is yeah. what we were doing. We wanted to play new records, and the idea back then was not to pay a lot of money for them. It was to get them as cheaply as you fucking could, so you yeah. could have plenty new to play. You know, uh, so it was about new records, really. That's a great perspective, and I think that's something that Mike says to me often is, man, I just feel bad for you guys going after some of these records today because it is hard. You know, it's about the coin. It's about the network. Mike, what's your perspective on that? Just kind of add a little bit to what Kev said. I I just feel that the whole real market, is, especially now, the scene is not touched at all as far as as far as the records go. Um, I mean, they only play what everybody else plays. So if you hear it on this guy's turntable or this guy's Instagram or Facebook, they just keep spinning around looking for those same records, which is similar to the northern scene. But man, there's a ton of records that are great records that are still ten to forty dollar records, and they're just like they're they're basically unplayed, man. People just don't play them because they don't know them. You know what I mean? We're never gonna run out. Kev will, I'm sure Kev will vouch for me on this. We're never gonna run out of music that we're learning. You know what I mean? We're con I, I, at least for me, I'm constantly learning, and I got like thirty five years only. I know Kev's got a, a lot longer than me, and. He's definitely seen seen this go full circle all the way around, uh, but I still see a lot of records, even good Northern Soul records that don't even get played. You know, like great records, they just don't get played, man. Because they're yeah, they're they're twenty thirty dollar records. They're not ego, or they're not, you know, they're not in fashion. You know, all right, egos are thing. I've got a huge ego though, and I used to fucking uh, DJ. Yeah, My ego, ego counted for, a lot when I was for, DJing. You got ego for your dancing and your kung fu. Wow. Why? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> all right, all right, Kev. B before we get to our, our viewer question, I, I need to know how is it that you want to be remembered for the body of work, your impact? Just as a fucking good DJ. You know, I did the compilations not to share the music with the world because I care about the world. I did them to get bookings because I wanted bookings. There's the honest answer. Uh, and I do love it when folk get So I enjoyed this Saturday night thing I went to. It was all under 20 or. 20 to 25 year olds on listening to Northern and it was nice and I, I like to see folk get into the music but the reason I did the compilations were just to get fucking bookings really and I love DJing my I'm at my element when I'm DJing and I just remember me as fuck me he was a good DJ that'll do me and, so, and a handsome bastard fuck me, a good DJ and a handsome bastard no I, I love that but I think for me just this past week I have received a handful to so many messages from people telling me about your impact, how the music that you put out changed their lives, whether it's, you know, Jimmy Soul Radio in, in the conversation we were having a few nights ago at 3 a.m. How Bye. do you feel when, when you hear things like that, that, that you made an impact like that on someone's life through music? Oh, of course I feel like, oh, that's good. And all that. Yeah, and I'm glad Jimmy's still going. Or June, I knew him as. Aye, I mean, yeah, I remember him with his shirt off dancing in Tokyo in 1999. 
<laughs> and dancing all fucking night. He didn't get off the floor all night. I thought, there's a keen young fellow. So I started speaking to him. So, yeah, yeah. if I see keen young people, I'll go and speak to them. If, you know what I mean? They turn up first time, you've not seen them before, and they look keen. Then, all right, pal, you into this stuff. Oh, I'll be it. Well, I used to get them to the back then, but I suppose you send them links nowadays. Oh, no. Right. And I don't care about my impact. I just want to fucking DJ. Um, I don't know. No, yeah, I'm pleased. If, uh, oh, there's a new man came on. So, yeah. so this is this is a part of our show that we've been trying to do. We we do a, a virtual question where we allow someone who's been watching to come on and ask our, our special guest a question. We we are joined well, by the founder of of Wax Thematic, Nathan Womack. Nathan, meet oh. Kev, Kev. Meet Nathan. Nice yeah, hairstyle you got there, man. I got it from you, my man. You're the inspiration. Ah, uh, good. See, you're right. I inspire people. <laughs> I got my glasses upstairs. <laughs> uh, oh well. Kev, it's a it's an honor to be on the live with you, man. I've been listening to your mixes and and all your selections for years and years and years, man. I love the energy. Thank you so much. Oh, hooch, hooch! You're welcome. <laughs> you're a ginger, <laughs> aren't you? Your grandparents Irish or Scottish? Uh, more so Irish, not so much Scottish. Irish, unfortunately. Well, they're all right. Uh, as long as they're not English. Uh. <laughs> Uh, so I got a question for you. So I know you spent some time in the Philippines, and I want to uh -huh. know if you were able to dig for any records or if you found anything over there, because it's a place I've always... Well, you're fucking... You just put a story here, boy. Uh, so I was there when the typhoon struck, and it fucking wiped out the town I was living in. And, uh, and for three weeks, I was going and pulling out dead bodies and trying to convince the local barangay captains we needed to burn the bodies or I was going to get typhoid. And then um, they wouldn't listen. You know, there was just piles of bodies piling up. I'm like, you fucking idiots. So now we've got to wait for the police to come back. Anyway, a couple of ARC rescue boys from Philippine, whatever, it, arrived. And they said, OK, fucking hell, we'll convince them to burn them. But you want to see the ones that get washed up on the beach because they're fucking all swollen up after a few days. This is coming to records, by the way. <laughs> you know that. I thought, OK, then. I'll take a walk down the beach with you to look at dead bodies on the beach or from the stuff. I guess on the beach, and this, the, this is not a lie, the coastline was covered in 45s. Covered in 45s. Mostly broken, but I got a few copies of surf instrumentals. I got a weird version of um, my Chuck Berry song and a couple of Stevie Wonder covers. I got about a pile like that of good condition Filipino records. And then says to my wife, what the fuck's going on here? Is God smiling on me because my house was destroyed or something? And she said, oh, no, uh, that'll be whatever his name was, probably wobbly wobbly. Uh, he used to be a radio DJ in Manila in the 60s and 70s, and then he retired onto this island in the 90s, and he had all his records in his house, but his house was destroyed, and he was killed in the typhoon. That'll be his records <laughs> pushing back and forward. Oh so I actually found fucking thousands of records on the beach after the typhoon. There's a place to find records now. Wow. Wow. That is incredible. <laughs> Couldn't they find a record player in the shops? CDs, but none in the shops. But on the beach, fucking thousands of records, but only about that many weren't broken. The rest had been smashed with a wave type thing. Wow. So there's records wow. there. Wow. Did that answer your question? <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> Kev, thank you so much. <laughs> yeah. Wow. <laughs> Nathan, anything I don't else before find them in the shops easy, though. That's the thing. But I was just very lucky. Well, I wasn't very lucky, but, you know, I found them on the beach. <laughs> Miss Gold, Goldie say, says they, that's dark. <laughs> records are I, finding you, no matter what. They always find you. You go looking for them, but they always find you. Well, that's been my thing. I was saying that earlier. Records tend to find me. People were coming to my records, and then, obviously, God smiled upon me then, in that moment, and thought, oh, poor Keb, his house has been destroyed. Let's dump some records on the beach for him. And so, <laughs> whichever God it was, did it. <laughs> wow. Mm -hmm. What was the best record that you pulled from that find? Uh, it was an instrumental, what was it, the Thunderbirds or something? It was on an orange label, and it was a version of the Peter Gunn thing. You know the Peter Gunn the theme? Yeah. yeah, it was an instrumental by uh, a Filipino surf band, which was like better than Dick Dale and better than uh, wow. there was only one other one I know that's better than that one. And that. Wow. But I sold it to Rockabilly DJ when I got back to Britain. I said, "Listen to this, you fucker! I've got a big tune for you." So he gave me some money. 
Wow. <laughs> That's crazy. Amazing. Uh, Nathan, yeah, I'm thinking of digging in the East when he when he talks about that stuff, man. <laughs> yeah, the, the Philippines is one place I've always wanted to go. I've I've dug in China, Thailand, and Hong Kong and Seoul, but the Philippines I never got to before 2020. Uh, you'll find fuck all there, I reckon. To be honest with you, oh, you'd have to spend a couple of years constantly digging to find it in there. It's yeah. very hard. You know, I went in Manila and all that. You couldn't see records anywhere. You know, I'm sure they're there somewhere, but in people's houses. They're not in yeah. shops or nobody deals in them. My fucking father-in-law, when I thumped all my records over there, he says to me, Kev, have you got any spare ones? What do you mean? You know, anything you can give me. What for? You, you, don't like, you don't have a record player. No, no, we used to, this is true, the Filipinos, we used to hang them up on a bit of string to scale the birds away from the rice after we just seeded it. <laughs> they used to use 45s. <laughs> On a string wobbling in the wind, <laughs> like you can fuck it right up. And he said it was common practice for farmers in the seventies to hang the fucking records on a bit of string, and it stopped birds picking at the rice. Wow. So there's been a few. Yeah. Uh. So uh. for the points of time, uh, that that's going to put an end to the, to the virtual question, Nathan. I want to thank you so much for joining in. Thank, thank you, Nathan. Thank you so much for answering. Thank you. Nice to now, meet you. Now we transition to the lightning round. These are ten quick questions. Oh, Tim, are you ready? Fucking hell! All right, I'm ready. Aye. All right, LP or forty-five. <laughs> <laughs> I need to answer. <laughs> Color or black vinyl? Oh come on, man! <laughs> black vinyl, forty-five. Right. Hey, listen, I ask everybody these questions. It would not be fair if I didn't ask you. Um, something that you'd listen to that would surprise us? Uh, big band stuff. I suppose it's my dad was a big Glenn Miller fan, Benny Goodman. So I went through a period of buying loads of Benny Goodman, Glenn Miller stuff, and I really enjoyed it. Might be nostalgia from when I was a kid, but I really enjoyed it. Okay. What's the first section you go to when you enter a record store? I don't really go to record stores. I haven't done for, uh, really, seriously, I don't think I've been to a record store for fucking 40 years, maybe. So, no, I don't. In America, your stores are different, though. I don't go here because there's fuck all to find here. You know? But then even in America, I was going to warehouses and dealers and stuff like that, not record stores. So okay. I'm, I've not, I can't answer that. I don't really go to record stores. That's Mike fine. Vague. He goes to see Mike Vague. I got to see Mike Vig, yeah. All right, football like that. Yeah. That that name comes up like every episode. It's it's so. Ah, I like Mike Vig. If you think I'm a mad bastard, where do you meet him? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, recommend a Soul Forty Five that we should check out that's impacted you significantly. Oh Jesus! You probably know them all. Uh, no, that's uh, yeah, Butch's whatever it's called cover up. There you go. Uh, <laughs> something that Butch is playing that nobody knows what it's really called. That's the one you should listen to. Okay, okay, I feel you. Um, You'll know the rest. Recommend a Garage 45 that's essential that we should go check out. Uh, the Squires, uh, going all the way. It's essential, it's the perfect garage, or the Gentleman, um, it's whatever it's called. Well, I can't remember the name. I'm too many records in my head, I can't remember names. It's that's a crying nice. shame by the Gentleman, is the epitome of garage, so... The yeah. gentleman in the crying shame is the perfect garage record. Okay. Go What's the most He's all the rules. ever spent on a record? Uh, 3,000. I couldn't uh, do more than that. It would be silly. 3,000. What was the record? Found. Eh? What was the that record? That was the Mellow that saved the youth. Okay. So that, but, that's, uh, like almost, that's almost like five grand there, Waxy. Oh, yeah. yeah and all those I, I know about the conversion. I've been in yeah, the conversion, so baby. Do the, conversion. Gotta do the conversion. <laughs> Listen, I always would use my credit card. I didn't, I didn't have the time to do the conversions. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> um, all right, let's see here. Kev, how many hours a day would you say that you would spend looking for, for records? Um, just on uh, Looking for, does that include listening through people's pages on YouTube and listening to things I don't know on YouTube and all that? Yep. Five, six hours a day? Love that. Okay. Uh, if you were a superhero, what would your superhero power be and why? That's easy. Not needing to go to the toilet during interviews. 
Oh, if that I one failed. That. Uh, All right, yeah. Time trip. Go about and get all the records I heard before and keep them this time. This is the last question here. If right. you had a theme song, what would it be and why? Uh, something like the Benny Hill theme song, because too many folk take it all too seriously. You know, it's meant to be fun. <laughs>